everyone. My name's Peter McMillan and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at NT Shelter. It's our pleasure today to bring you another episode of Sharing a Couch. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the land where we're broadcasting from here in Darwin, paying my respects to their elders, past and present, and to any other First Nations people who might be listening or watching uh, from right across Australia or elsewhere. Welcome. Today we've got Emma Greenhow joining us uh, from the Gold Coast. Uh, Emma was uh, appointed in March 2022 uh, as a Chief Executive Officer of National Shelter. Previously, she was the Manager of Strategic Projects at Q Shelter for three years. Emma has over 20 years experience in social policy, planning, research, advocacy and program development in the field of affordable housing and homelessness. This includes employment with research and tertiary education institutions, including AHURI, state and local governments, land development authorities, and the not-for-profit sector. Emma has graduate and postgraduate qualifications from Queensland University of Technology, including a Bachelor of Built Environment, Urban and Regional Planning, a Graduate Diploma in Urban and Regional Planning, and a Masters of Applied Research. She, I think I got that wrong. It's a Masters of Applied Science in Research, my mistake. <laughs> She's also been an adjunct member of the City's Research Institute at Griffith University since September 2022. Emma Greenhow, welcome to Sharing the Couch. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. And um, it's uh, great to have you on uh, into the role now for, um, I think it's about, about 15, 16 months. Uh, what yeah. a ride, hey? What, a lot of stuff happening in the housing space. Oh, it's been extraordinary. So not just to start a job, but... Um... You know, the change of government and uh, a wholesale change of the housing agenda has been um, pretty, pretty tremendous, um, but yeah, extraordinarily sort of busy, um, but still a lot to do. We'll unpack that uh, a fair bit as we go through in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, I was curious, it's, it's amazing what you find, you know, when you're looking up uh, colleagues on LinkedIn, and I'm unashamedly a stalker when it comes to LinkedIn. I call it curiosity. I really do like to know uh, about the people that I'm working with. And um, I felt uh, last night, how did I not know that you were a senior research institute for the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, or AHURI, for five years? In, in a, did you know it was in Queensland or were you down in yeah. Sydney there? It was, it was in Queensland. So um, it was before, it, it was around the time of AHURI at that point, before the sort of 1999 change um so when i left my uh so when i i'd finished my or part of my postgraduate studies uh went and worked for a who redo as a research assistant um with lecturers on master plan communities um and so they, they had some research projects on that and um then moved into sort of more the current stage and did a, a project on um boarding houses um in Queensland and New South Wales and Tasmania um, because at that time there was quite a bit happening in the boarding house space. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that, that was about five years um, after I'd finished my degree and then I thought I'd better go get a real job um, and went to, to Brisbane City Council from that. Wonderful. So it looks like you're a Queenslander through and through. Have I got that right? Living yeah. in the Gold Coast and working there and in Brisbane? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, Born in central western Queensland, lived in southwest Queensland. Um, so yeah, very, very, very Queensland um, sort of focused. Um, but no bananas or pineapples, you know, sort of like <laughs> growing in my backyard. Um, okay, well. But but I do just want to acknowledge that today I'm joining you from the office of um, Shelter New South Wales. So um, I uh, uh, Allegra Spender had a housing forum last night. Um, it was her second forum, so she's been actively engaging with her electorate around uh, housing and housing solutions, and um, John presented at the first forum, so they were unpacking the issues, and um, and last night uh, we were presenting on the policy uh, solutions that are available um, to address the, the housing issues that have been identified in, in her electorate. Oh, that's fantastic and, uh, you know, uh, error on my part to assume you'd be in Queensland when, in fact, you spend a lot of your time on the road, don't you, um, whether it be in Canberra um, or elsewhere across Australia, uh, doing that very thing, um, engaging, mm -hmm. I guess, with um, members of parliament and, and communities on housing. Yeah, yeah, it, and this month in particular, so um, 
started the month in Canberra. Oh no, she started the month in um, Melbourne. So just to give a flavour, and I think this this isn't about me and my job, but I think it's about the conversations that are going on around housing in the country at the moment and the levels of interest and diversity. So uh, the Capital City Council, Lord Mayors, had a, um, they've just established a community of practice for um, local government offices around housing and homelessness. So they had the sessions um, during Homelessness Week. So there was an opportunity to present about, you know, what is it that local governments can be doing, you know, based on um, the experiences that I had in uh, City of Brisbane and City of Gold Coast. Um, then went to Canberra where we supported a delegation of older women to meet with parliamentarians. Um, and uh, there was about, I think, eight older women and the re some researchers from um, Housing Action for the Aged group. Um, they had about 27 meetings across three days uh, at a Parliamentary Friends of Housing. I think that made a great impact on the parliamentarians. Um, and then here... Uh, I think there's been some other travel in there. Oh, in travelling to Brisbane, I always forget about that. Um, we were able to present at the Labor Fringe Festival for the National Conference on intergenerational um, equity and wealth and housing. So we had a panel um, on that. And then, you know, here for Allegra Spender and then Melbourne next week, we're having a panel um, relating to the National Housing and Homelessness Plan. So so it's good, you know, good opportunities to be having wide-ranging discussions and it's good to have this level of interest that isn't just about um, issues but solutions. Well, wow, that's uh, that's quite a, a dizzying kind of summary of what you've been up to in just the last week or so. Uh, I think that's uh, obviously a lot of time out of a suitcase and, and travelling and I think that obviously takes takes a lot of energy and commitment. So um, kudos to you for, for putting yourself out there and doing all those amazing things. Um, Emma, I just want to start off with, with when you left uh, when you left school, uh, I guess like a lot of people thinking, what, do I, what am I going to do when I go to go to university or TAFE uh, or mm -hmm. whatever they're wanting to do? So you decided uh, that build environment. What was it about build environment, urban and regional planning that grabbed your attention? Um, when I was in high school, I loved geography. So geography was my passion subject. Um, and when it came to putting in, you know, for courses and universities, it was like, well, what do I want to do with that? Um, and I didn't want to just do a geography degree. I think I couldn't sort of see at that age where that would lead me or, or but I, I think just sort of thinking of just doing pure geography for three years um, wasn't something I wanted to do. And so I think what planning did for me was bring together a number of elements related to geography that I had an interest in, in terms of, you know, social geography and human geography and the environment, and, you know, there's economics in there. So um, so that's that's really how I ended up doing planning, um, purely because I didn't want to do geography. Um, but then by going into planning, I mean, and, and it's been great, um, really struggled with it to start off with and nearly quit because um, it was so design focused because what they were doing at that time was putting a lot of the built environment um, courses together. So you had planners and landscape architects and architects, industrial and interior designers. So there was a lot of overlap. Um, so there was quite a lot of design to start with. So that's not what I was expecting, you know, when I went in there, um, but it was something that was really enjoyable. In terms of design, I mean, in terms of, as far as the skills are concerned, to me, they just seem when you when I think about things like urban planning and or spatial planning and and zoning and all those different uh, aspects, I guess you're right. Architecture and design play an important part, but do they take different skills than being a planner? Is like an element of creativity or that that design and art? Is that they have different skill sets from, I guess. Um, being, say, a planner that might be working for a local government, um, trying to get um, zoning and all that stuff done? Yeah, I think I think with the, the design element that started at university, some of it was about just, um, I don't know, it was just like unravelling your brain and opening up and, you know, so it wasn't about art. It was just, so, so some of our first assignments, you know, I found really um, difficult because they were sort of a bit arts-focused, but... You know, it was just about trying to sort of unpack design. And then some of those design elements or the pro, it was about the design process, you know, that, that they were trying to sort of get us to understand to start with in terms of, 
aims and objectives and, you know, and some of it was the physical kind of skills of like how you represent your um, thoughts, you know, literally on A3 and A2 pieces of paper. Um, so, so we didn't have a lot to do with the architects who, you know, got into the more technical stuff, but, you know, we, we got to do sort of like larger sort of scale design um, at a suburb level, um, you know, associated them with, you know, all of the evidence and research and reports, you know, that go with it that planners love, um, you know, down to some smaller site sort of, um, you know, site specific, um, you know, uh, projects as well. So it, it was really quite sort of broad and, um, you know, in, in terms of scale, um, you know, and, and I think they really tried to give us a, an education that was, um, I think at that time wasn't just about outcomes, but but very much about process. Interesting, and uh, sounds very interesting. Uh, those projects, and and in terms of your first foray into the affordable housing and homes space, from what I can tell from your CV, it looks like Brisbane City Council back in two thousand and three. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of, I guess, connected you into that uh, area's program officer at council. Would would you say that was your first exposure to housing and homelessness, or had you had an earlier engagement? Um, I think the, the research that I did at Ahuri was in terms of um, there was boarding house research, and there was also caravan park research. There was a project that we did in two thousand and one um, for the Queensland Department of Housing around caravan parks in southeast Queensland um, because what was happening at that time is that there was a number of closures of caravan parks that were for long-term, you know, residents that was obviously having quite an impact on, um, you know, housing and homelessness for those residents and government was having to come in and do coordinated closure responses. Um, so, so that particular project was looking at, you know, caravan parks in southeast Queensland. What have been the closures? What are the motivations for owners? Um, so, you know, doing a, a desktop piece of work and some field research and interviewing caravan park owners and managers and, you know, industry peak as well as having um, someone who assisted us to do the work with the residents about, you know, what does living there mean? Um, so, so there was that piece. And I do contemplate going back to resurrect that um, to see, you know, what, what those changes are. Uh, and then the boarding house piece was very much around, um, you know, standards and what was going on in the boarding house industry at that time because in Queensland there'd been um, the introduction of legislation in response to the Childers Backpackers fire right. um, a, as well as Brisbane City Council were having some very specific boarding house responses uh, to assist owners in relation to some of the costs that they, you know, were struggling with. So, you know, two sort of really important um, parts of the housing system, you know, that house very low income, you know, and vulnerable, vulnerable people. Um, and then when I went to Brisbane City Council, that was my first sort of, like I said, I think, you know, first kind of proper job. Um, and that was in the social policy area. Um, so housing, affordable housing and homelessness. And Brisbane City Council at that time, it had a, a homelessness strategy um, and a housing strategy you know, they'd not long um, part funded the uh, Brisbane Housing Company. And they were doing really, um, I think, you know, some really exciting things at that time, uh, which, you know, some have continued. Um, and I think have been influential, you know, for other local governments as well. Um, but, you know, they, they've got the budget and the scale, you know, and the, I think really the geographic opportunity, um, given the, the size of BCC, you know, to be able to do some of those things. Hmm. Fantastic. Now, after that um, period of time, you worked uh, in a in a range of areas for urban planning authorities, for for local government. Uh, you're on the Logan Renewal uh, Ministerial Consultative Committee. You're a member of that. You've also done a fair bit of um, academic work and and um, and uh, lecturing and, and the like. Um, and I'd like to uh, move towards when you were at the um, Commonwealth Games uh, doing the project management there for housing homelessness responses for the Brisbane um, Commonwealth. Oh, was that Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, wasn't it? Gold Coast. Yeah, that, yeah, that was, was the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, just, yeah. Just, just before we arrived there, what, in terms of those that work you've done in housing homelessness policy space as well and practice, as well as the um, urban planning and, and so forth, um, 
what were some of your, what would you look back and think, well, gee, they were some really interesting times or some really big achievements during that during that period for you? The the one um big win for me was after I finished at the city of Brisbane, went to the city of Gold Coast and they had a housing strategy. Um but they were like chalk and cheese in terms of their approaches. So, you know, City of Brisbane was um, saying this is our role in housing, you know, and, and I guess and, and homelessness are kind of getting its hands dirty in a way, you know, whereas the, the City of Gold Coast was reluctant and, um, you know, didn't didn't want to be doing, yeah, just, just didn't obviously want to do the same kinds of things that the City of Brisbane did. So very different approaches. Um, but what ha- what was happening at that time is that there were two community housing organisations who were uh, amalgamating. So I was sitting on the, there was a committee that was advising or involved in that amalgamation process. And um, when the Brisbane Housing Company was set up, the state and the local government provided funds to establish that housing company. Whereas for the Gold Coast Housing Company, they came out of this amalgamation and um, didn't want to rely on state or local government funding. However, um, there was a request that went to the state to say, would you provide funding, you know, to this entity? And the state said, well, we will, uh, but the city of Gold Coast has to as well. So, um, So I think one of my sort of, you know, wins, and I think a big win at that time was, and it was a you know a twelve month process of um, council coming around and then providing that it was you know three million dollars over three years, um, but to then that meant there was fifteen million dollars coming from the state. So you know for a council that wasn't involved in housing, um, you know to then be providing three million dollars, uh, you know was fairly fairly significant. But you know it was quite a process um, to to get to that point, but. That, that to me is probably one of the, the most exciting things that I had done, um, you know, to get that win. That's a terrific achievement. And uh, tell us about the Commonwealth Games then. Um, exciting period for, for the Gold Coast. Um, mm-hmm. Great time uh, for, you know, sort of celebration. Uh, obviously, uh, in the lead up to that, there's um, there's new infrastructure being built. There's, I guess, there's issues and opportunities around housing and legacy housing mm-hmm. after the Games as well. What was your role there in terms of looking at the the project for housing and homelessness yeah. uh, issues? So what I uh, came in as was the project manager to a process that had already been designed. Um, and as, as soon as the Commonwealth Games had been announced, um, the Gold Coast Hi- um, Homelessness Network, you know, had already started to engage with the minister and the government to say, you've got to do something, you've got to do something. Um you know, you can't leave this to the last minute or you can't leave this to, you know, or not do anything at all. Um, So a response was put together by the Department of Housing um, and then my role was to come in and basically implement that response but also sort of refine it. Um, And part of the, the response as well is so while I was working in the, in government, in the department, uh, there was funding that had been provided for somebody for the Gold Coast Homelessness Network as well. Um, so we sort of worked together, but then would, you know, I would deal with government stuff and she would deal with community stuff. So the government had, it started off as about a $1 million response and sort of got it a, a little bit further. Um, you know, there's a little bit of extra money that went with it. Um And it was really about trying to sort of manage the impacts of the games. Um, It was also trying to insert ourselves into some of the processes um, leading up to the games to make it easier, um, you know, to reduce the impact on, on people experiencing homelessness, on, you know, social housing residents who might be in the precincts, um, you know, that are related to the games. So, so the response then became about um, ensuring that there was service continuity for residents um, or, or for, you know, people experiencing homelessness so that they could continue to, to access services. Uh, it was about ensuring that um, emergency accommodation was still there. Um, and part of that was about, you know, 
because there's such a reliance on motels, you know, for, for emergency accommodation, we wanted to make sure that it um, continued, um, but also that if um, there were people who were experiencing homelessness or, or who had been um, forced out of rental accommodation because of the games, then there was something there in an emergency for them to go to. There was additional brokerage money. There was extensions to homelessness services. And this ran for a period before the games, during the games and following the games. Um, just trying to think what else there was. There was some monitoring uh, around housing, you know, prices. Um, the RTA, the Residential Tenancies Authority, were doing monitoring in terms of what was going on in the market to make sure that people weren't being kicked out for a period of time so property owners could take advantage of, you know, short-term accommodation. Um, there, yeah, there was it was quite a package that was about you know, trying to ensure that the games organising um, had regard for people experiencing housing and homelessness, but also to really manage the impacts during that kind of games period as well. Um, and and it was really a 12-month project, yeah. So do you think that, I think it's Brisbane's getting the uh, Olympics in 2032 from, from memory, are there lessons learnt from there and, and will they be kind of, I guess, calling on people like yourself to help inform how we can get ready and have uh, have a good legacy uh, from that initiative uh, when yeah. it comes to housing? And I think uh, so, so probably two things. One is um, Q Schultz is doing a great job. So they've commissioned, you know, had commissioned a piece of work which was about the legacy piece uh, for housing and homelessness but social inclusion more broadly. Um you know, and I'm aware that, for example, their executive director, Fiona, was um, at a Senate hearing actually this week about the impact of the the Olympic Games. Um, you know, so they've been, I think, engaging really well in terms of, you know, what the legacy piece is and how you reduce those impacts, um, you know, in the lead up to the Games and then, you know, during the Games. So um, so, so I think they've got that space um, handled really well in terms of that piece. I think from my sort of experience from the Commonwealth Games, which is, you know, so small when you compare it to the Olympics, though, um, it really is that planning piece. And I think as soon as you, you know, that the Games are announced, you you have to really take a social impact sort of framework um, to housing and homelessness for the Games, you know, you can't leave it to the last minute or 12 months or 12 months out to sort of start some sort of process. I mean, for something like the Olympics, you've really got to be looking at it now that, you know, what is that legacy? The legacy isn't just the use of accommodation facilities for social and affordable housing. It's making sure that the urban development that happens before that includes social and affordable housing, you know, there's the possibility, you know, the likely possibility that this is the impact on Brisbane is going to be so enormous and, um, you know, and what that means for lower income housing in particular locations. You know, we're already seeing substantial development proposals. Um, there's one near the Princess Alexandra Hospital, significant amount of apartments, but none of those will be social and affordable housing, you know thousands of dwellings that are going to be brought on board but there's no mechanism like inclusionary zoning to be capturing that so so that the legacy piece out of the olympics isn't just what's left of the athletes village it's what is left out of this wholesale urban change you know for low-income residents um and that to me is the really big piece that's missing i think in the olympics discussion right now um, oh. and, and in terms of, you know, the implementation of, you know, sort of the planning regime um, in the lead up to the Olympics. So you mentioned inclusion resigning, and I'll, I do have a question for you about that, um, which we'll uh, go back to in, in just a minute. So I'm just curious uh, around your thoughts around housing supply and, uh, again, we'll talk more about the Commonwealth agenda later in the conversation, but there's a lot of housing in principle coming to Australia with that aspirational and now ambitious target of 1.2 uh, million homes across Australia 
in the five years from the 1st of July next year. Mm. So let's just say uh, we get we hit that target or we go a long way towards hitting that target. Let's be optimistic for the moment. Um, how how do we have that conversation from an urban planning, um, from built environment dis, uh, perspective? We've got the number of houses now. That's great. But who needs to be involved in that conversation? How does it happen where we mm-hmm. translate that ambition into something on the ground that resembles livable communities with great environment um, and getting that mix right where you've got um, a portion uh, allocated for social affordable housing, which I know is a very rooted, very simplistic way of describing inclusionary zoning where you're planning, I guess, or building some sort of mechanism in to ensure that we have a fixed minimum yeah. percentage of social affordable. How, who are the actors in that? And how do we make sure that we don't roll out housing um, in the wrong location or in the wrong configuration or in ways that replicate some mistakes we might have had in the past with public housing rollout, for example? Yeah. No, and, and it, it, this came up last night too at the, the forum, you know, about, well, how do we make sure that those dwellings, you know, in the case that they were talking about in Sydney, isn't just pushing further out into the western areas and continuing to create these, um, the lights have gone off here, um, oh, <laughs> continuing to create these sort of, you know, heat areas. Um, so it is, it's about, you know, climate change and, you know, energy efficiency of dwellings and, you um, and affordability, but but you're right to want to. We've got 1.2 million dwellings on the table under the National Housing Accord. You know, we want to see that there is a portion of that that is social and affordable housing. You know, the the accord says that it's well located housing. You know, it's in well located areas, and I think broadly we all know what that means in relation to you know transport infrastructure and those sorts of things, but. So the federal government sort of put this, I guess it's the aspiration of what they want, but it's going to be at the state and territory level, you know, where those planning mechanisms come into place and and those designs um, about, you know, where that, that housing goes, you know, coupled with, you know, the role of local government. So I think this, this is one of the things too around how housing is delivered in Australia is, you know, we've got this aspiration coming, you know, from one level of government, but, you know, the actors of who does the delivery are another level of government um, and, and trying to get those levers working well, um, you know, can, can be a little bit difficult. So it's really then about ongoing conversations and, and you know, advocacy and engagement with state and local, you know, and with federal government about those expectations Um rather than just, yeah, we just don't want to have an announcement and then nothing. Yeah. Um, so can we break, that's absolutely, can we break this down a little bit in terms of um, a number of aspects? So first of all, let's just maybe look at the aesthetic aspect for a, for a start. So one of the things that I, I personally find dismaying, I don't think I'm the only person, but when you go to some um, of the suburbs in far western Sydney or, or, or in Melbourne or elsewhere, it seems to be a whole lot of houses jam-packed up against each other with not much gaps between the roofs or the fences. Mm-hmm. There doesn't seem to be a lot of amenity there. It's, a, it's not a sort of place that grabs me as being somewhere I personally want to want to live. How mm-hmm. do we first? How do we get that amenity right? And how do we make sure that um, we've got that concept that it's not just about maximising the value per square metre of the, of the block, but we actually have communities where longer term people are going to want to live where they've got you know, amenity where they've got past um, mm. infra- community infrastructure, parks, um, et cetera, uh, and climate uh, resilient. Have you got any thoughts yeah. around that? And I think, uh, to me, this brings to the conversation too around density, you know, um, and when you think about what goes on in the outer suburbs in relation to it's, you know, everybody has their own block of land, even though you can reach out and touch the neighbours, you know, probably or, um, you know, walk from one roof to the other because, you know, the focus on on freehold, um, you know, but, but trying to deliver density, you know, in other parts of the city, which could mean we're not having to do, you know, larger scale development on the edge. We, we need to have more in the inner, inner suburbs and middle ring, you know, so we're not having so much at the outer edge. Um, you know, and one of the things that came up last night at this forum um, 
that someone else presented was, you know, the number of spare bedrooms that are sitting in the space in Sydney between the 10 to 25 um, kilometres, you know, from the um, city centre, which are, you know, the highly desirable sort of areas. And, um, you know, that that these are areas that are probably not doing the heavy lifting that we need. And because that's not happening, then, you know, we are pushing out further and further. Um, so I think, so I think the conversation around density, but density done well, because the other thing that we're not seeing is where there, I think people's reactions to density is about where density has been done so poorly, you know, so it's either been, um, you know, incredible scales with probably not a lot of deep planting, not a lot of social infrastructure and community infrastructure around it. So so people are suspicious. So we're sort of coming from a negative, you know, base to and and then they don't necessarily trust probably what are some of the good proposals that are being put forward. So I think with so I think what's happening on the edge of the cities is also a bit of a failure of, you know, what is happening in those those middle rings. Um but I think also too, it's about well, what what is happening in the case of how hard it is to to get some of those approvals. And um, a case in point for for me is on the Gold Coast in Southport, which you know is incredibly urban. Um, and someone wanted to do some sort of tiny sort of developments. Um, it was called a micro village. But the approval process was so difficult um, that, you know, if you're probably another developer, you just go, well, I'm just going to put up a three-storey walk up and maximise the site and do all of this stuff because it's easier. But to try and do um, freehold on sort of like four metre or, or three metre frontages was just really difficult. But then when you look at it, as a as a streetscape, as a product, and you go in and you, you know, touch it, feel it, walk around it, it's beautiful. It's not going to be for everybody, but in a highly urbanised environment, um, it, it absolutely makes sense. But yet the ability to do that is just so incredibly onerous and expensive. So um, if you're a developer, you'd just be going, well, why would I even bother? I want to do something that's... different, but yeah, why? Well, that's why? What I... I guess that's what I'm interested in the the uh, the ways that we can get development done. That's not necessarily all the same sort of limited options off the plan, but where we can get um, good principles of design architecture into what uh, master planning these communities. Yeah, uh, I think. Um, sorry, I'm go back to to Queensland, but the department in Queensland had been doing some um, projects for social housing and having architecturally sort of designed housing and and one of them um which is in Southport again Anne Street Gardens, you know, is it a it's a, a national award winning project. It's been on um, you know, Tim Rosso's sort of ABC project. Um beautiful, you know, beautiful redevelopment of old existing social housing. Uh, I think there were three lots, you know, and um so you know I think but I, I guess the point out of that is, you know, there's there's a role too, I think, for government about being able to demonstrate, you know, so one is this social housing sort of density done well um, and then also sort of reflecting back into work that I'd done previously at the Urban Land Development Authority, which is now Economic Development Queensland, you know, they had Fitzgibbon Chase, which was... Um, you know, it was almost like a showcase of how you can do different types of density and, and dwelling types in a suburb um, where they, they were getting local governments, and I think they still are, to come out and have a look, you know. So I think I think there is a role for government to demonstrate how it can be done, and I know that from the ULDA that that did influence, you know, the work that continues around um, housing diversity in suburbs and master plan communities, but... But you can't just do the different housing sizes without doing the other elements, which is around the planting and the parks and the infrastructure. So if you're only choosing the housing time, you know, you you then and and don't follow through with that community infrastructure and other things, then you know, you're doing yourself a disservice and the community a disservice. 
you know, it is all of those elements, um, you know, that that make places work a lot better. Um, and we know it can be done. Um, but, yeah, it still is about, you know, I think a choice um, to not do it. Makes sense, uh, Emma. And I think one of the things as we, uh, I guess the other thing that that was, uh, as you mentioned already, that came out of that um, announcement from National Cabinet was about well-located houses and I guess acknowledging that we want key workers to be where the jobs are and have to save time on commutes and the productivity yeah. benefits of that, but also the notion that you know, people want to live um, where there's good amenities, access mm -hmm. to transport and and, and every like everybody else does as well. That's right. um, just in terms of uh, the notion that the housing is is coming, you know, we'll, of course we've been saying for a long time in the Shelter Network that we need more social and affordable housing, and and um, we'll be saying that for some time until obviously until it, we get the job done. But for people that might be a little bit anxious uh, about more social housing, because maybe there's been they've been neighbours or in communities where social where public housing traditionally hasn't been managed well and where there's been issues. Uh, and we've seen uh, right across Australia public housing not being maintained particularly well. It's ageing stock. There's been deferred maintenance and a whole lot of other issues. How can we provide some confidence that we can roll out more housing in our communities, including that proportion of social and affordable, where people can feel, well, it's going to be OK, we can actually get this done well? Mm. Good question. You know, and I think... Um... You know, we are grappling with legacy pieces around social housing, um, you know, where some of the issues that, you know, neighbours might be dealing with it because it's been so severely underfunded. You know, I don't think it's an issue because it is social housing, you know, um, uh, you know, as a tenure, but it's the, the, the issues that we're seeing are because it's been so underfunded for so long, you know, that maintenance hasn't been done or, you know, the sector is so residualised, um, um, you know, so instead of having, you know, diversity in the tenants, um, you know, that might be in social housing, you know, it's so residualised that, you know, it's really difficult to try and, I mean, I just think about, you know, community housing providers when they've got, developments and they've got vacancies you know they try really hard to sort of create communities and have you know think about the tenants who are living there and how do they make sure that there's not um you know conflicts and issues and you know that there's compatibility so I think um what we see is the result of all of those years and decades of of underfunding you know and and you know so we're having to make up for that. I think when it comes to, you know, community concern around social and affordable housing, um, you know, I guess it's been so easy to focus on the negatives. You know, it's so easy for tabloids, you know, television to, to sort of look at all of those negativities and not sort of consider all of the, the good things that, you know, either departments might be doing or community housing providers might be doing, um, you know, in terms of creating communities and supporting their tenants. So I think for people who might have a concern around social housing would be, you know, there is always something, and I know I said this before, you know, to engage with community housing providers. Um, you know, and community housing providers have been, you know, I think, you know, I've learned lessons about um, the conversations they have with communities maybe before they even go in there. Um, you know, I think have a have a curiosity around it, you know, and and talk to providers and, and government. But, but I think the other thing too is um, we forget that, and I live next door to, to social housing. I've got so, um, social housing right next door to me. And, you know, if I have a problem, if there was a problem there, well, I know to ring the department, for example, but if that was a private renter, you know, so I think if if there are issues in relation to social and affordable housing, people already know who to ring and have a level of engagement that they wouldn't if they were having issues with um, a homeowner or a private private renter. So, so there's, you know, a whole range of avenues that people can be engaging with social and affordable housing from a 
uh, I think a curiosity level through to a sort of maybe a complaints level. Um, but but I also think that government and community housing providers, you know, are fully aware of, you know, community concern um, and I think are engaging, you know, quite differently um, to how they, they used to and, you know, and are seeking community buy-in. And I think, you know, one of the skills that you're most uh, recognised for, I see, is stakeholder engagement. So I think if we're going in to try and house people who um, are, say, easy to house or people who are maybe a little bit more challenged to house, maybe people who um, are leaving the justice system or need some intensive case management support, it's about how um, services engage with the local communities and neighbours, isn't it, to, to build a supportive community? That's that's right, and I think that you know what you brought up too around services. Like when you think about, um, you know, what's happened in I think social housing previously is, you know, in thinking about where communities might have been challenging is, um, probably those services haven't followed those communities, or you know, there hasn't been the level of support for households. So, you know, I think we all know when when those levels of support aren't there you know, issues, um, you know, manifest. And um, and and I think the other thing too is, um, you know, when people think about problems in social housing, um, you know, we automatically revert to kind of the bigger states and, and that sort of stuff. And, you know, I think government's learned its lesson. I think we've all learned our lesson around um, focused, you know, areas, you know, where there's such a focus on, disadvantage and poverty, um, you know, so that's the other part of, you know, the policies that we're trying to unravel as well, you know. Absolutely. So we're, we're trying to unravel problems with, you know, where there's been funding issues or, or lack of funding along with, you know, sort of poor policy decisions. So I said I would come back to inclusionary zoning. Ask you just to outline that. I guess I'd like to outline. I guess I'd like to ask you to outline what it is, and it can it can be obviously voluntary or it can be mandatory, um, but also so I guess there can be incentives uh, for development, or there can be like requirements under mm -hmm. planning um, schemes. So maybe you could talk a bit about what inclusionary zoning is, just so we've got a good understanding yeah. of it. But also, can um, whether it's a concept that developers should be concerned about. You know, sometimes you you hear that oh, look, it's a new tax, or there might be reasons why they don't like it. it's going to increase the costs of their builds or whatever. Yeah. Can you maybe speak to that as well as to whether it's something that should be feared or whether it's something we yeah. should be actually embrace? So, I mean, at its most basic level, um, inclusionary zoning is a requirement that comes in. Um, on a development approval. So, you know, whether it's, um, you know, it could be the material change of use, um, you know, or the rezoning, you know, um, that it requires that a proportion of a development uh, is to be used for social and affordable housing. So ob obviously that means, you know, residential development. Um, but the other thing too with it is... Um, it could also be um, money in lieu of product. So it's a requirement for either the product or a cash contribution that goes towards social and affordable housing. Um, so at the moment, we only see inclusionary zoning operating really in New South Wales um, in a sort of mandatory sense. Um, Victoria has a voluntary approach, which is a bit, I'd say it's messy. Um, but but what you're wanting out of inclusion rezoning really is, I guess it becomes a, a certainty. So if it's, you know, mandatory, it's a certainty that um, projects will deliver social and affordable housing or funding. Um, it becomes a bit of an ongoing stream. So as communities change, you know, you get social and affordable housing that's in there. But the one thing I think we've got to be clear on is it's not the silver bullet to, you know, our, our woes around social and affordable housing. It's just one of the mechanisms that we can utilise to to deliver, you know, more, more social and affordable housing. Um, so in the case of Sydney, that's been around um, since the Building Better Cities Day. So that's how that one came about for Piermont, Ultimo and City West Community Housing are the beneficiaries of that. 
Um, the proportions in Sydney are really quite low, though. They're about 3%, um, you know, which is, is quite low. Um, you know, ideally, you might want to see it at sort of 10%. You might want to then see on government land that it's considerably higher. The, the issues that developers have come back with is, you know, and they say, oh, this is a tax on, on housing, but the work that the Constellation Project has done, which we've been involved with, is, um, you know, it's about when you sort of implement inclusionary zoning. So if government were to come out today and say that all development from tomorrow must have an affordable housing component, um, then I think, you know, developers would rightly say it's a tax because what they have done is a project feasibility based on, you know, the regulations at that time. Um, whereas when you bring in inclusion rezoning, so you might sort of say we're going to bring it in in a few, few years' time, it gives them that opportunity, you know, one, they're completing their projects, but then it means that purchases of land, you know, that might happen in three years' time, they factor inclusion rezoning into that, you know. So then it becomes really about the residual price of the land because when you're factoring in your affordable housing component, then it leads to, you know, what is the land cost? So it really is about how you bring it in, so the timing component. Um, so it's not to be brought in, you know, sort of like from tomorrow. It, it needs to have, you know, a bit of a lead in time to allow the development industry to, I guess, work on the projects that they have and the feasibilities that they've got. Um, and then, you know, future land purchases, you know, bake um, inclusionary zoning, you know, into the land price. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful, that explanation. Uh, and in terms of the National Housing Accord, um, We've got involved there that all the state and territory um, first ministers. Uh, we've got the Commonwealth government, obviously. We've got the Australian Local Government Association. Uh, there's the Property Council. Uh, there is um, the institutional investment. I'm presuming something like industry super. There's a whole range of uh, stakeholders party to that accord. There's probably master builders and others. I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. um, in terms of that group. What's the level of consensus, I guess? Two questions. What's the level of consensus in that group around how to move forward with addressing our social and affordable housing issues? I'm assuming there'll be areas of disagreement, but what's the broad level of consensus we might have reached? And um, secondly, is there a case for state and territory governments to think about putting together similar groups of um, stakeholders to address how we can now roll out mm -hmm. housing that's coming? Yeah, yeah. Um... I'm not not really sure in terms of you know I think one of the things with the housing accord is I guess um it sort of feels like something that's happening over there in terms of its implementation um but I think thinking around some of those stakeholders you know there's the National Affordable Housing Alliance which we're a part of which has you know the HIA and the master builders and the property council and and others like Cheer and Homelessness Australia. And I think when, when, when I think about what's going on in relation to housing um, and affordable housing, I think there's like there's a lot more agreement than there is disagreement. You know, um, I think something like inclusionary zoning is where there's, you know, a bit of tension, um, you know, and I think industry groups are speaking out against that more than probably, say, some developers, you know, because some of the large developers like lend -Lease, you know, operate, you know, in the UK where they have to deliver inclusionary zoning, so they're used to it. Um, but I think I think in terms of those industry groups, there there is more consensus, you know, with the sector on issues. And I think I, I would not think that there'd be anything um, to lose by... And I don't think it has to be government that brings them together. You know, it could be shelters <laughs> that brings them together. I think in terms of having those dialogues with similar groups, you know, in state and territory jurisdictions, um, you know, because I think we broadly do want to all be ending up in the same place. Um, and the and the other thing too is sometimes it's easier to have those conversations um, you know, not behind closed doors, but 
but for, for not having those conversations to always be playing out in the public as well, you know, where there is um, tension. So so I think there is value, absolutely. I think, you know, I think it was called, you know, unlikely alliances or strategic partnerships or however you sort of do it, but, but we can't be... You know, I think that we can't all be sort of sitting separately and kind of talking at each other. Um, you know, we've all got to be in the same room because and 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 talking with each other. Absolutely. No, that's that's well said. So as we said a couple of times now, we've got the uh the aspirations under the accord of 1.2 million homes over five years. We've also got a um, significant amount of social affordable housing coming uh, under the HAF um, once that gets through the Senate. And, and of course, we hope it's it's uh, when, not if. Uh, there's also the Social Housing Accelerator, which in our case up here in the Northern Territory uh, should see 100 new homes uh, built, which is very exciting mm -hmm. as well. So we've got a lot of housing construction coming through. Uh, I guess we're coming uh, from a point of view where we're still emerging from COVID with supply chain issues. And we've got uh, some of our states and territories that have labour supply issues and skills and, and the like. What's your, how do you feel about our ability to hit that aspirational target? And, and maybe not, um, can we do it, but what will it take for us to do that? Well, I think one of the things about the the target, you know, I think right, we've got these constraints, you know, in terms of we've had supply issues and and labour force issues. Um, I think something that's sort of not spoken about when it comes to housing too is, you know, we have the approvals, um, but we don't always have the completions. So, <laughs> so, you know, so I think it's about. Um, you know, it's that factor of land markets and developers, you know, in relation to when they decide to bring developments online. So I think that's the the sort of missing part of the conversation here is we've got this aspiration of 1.2 million homes. Maybe we'll get the approvals, you know, even if the supply chain stuff is sorted out. But what about the completions and the bringing it to market, you know, Um so that people can actually live in these dwellings. So I'm just going to, you know, sort of throw that in there and then just sort of park it because I just feel like that that is a part that's never really talked about how the market actually operates. We'll just explore that a little bit. Why why when there's a situation where there's so so little stock available to rent uh, and, um, you know, uh, rates of uh, rates of residential construction are low. Why aren't they bringing that land to market? Why, why is there a lot of why is there a lot of criticism about red tape and not releasing land from governments where there is, as you say, some land that's uh, that has been brought to completion? What's going on there? Is it price or are there other factors? Well, I mean, I, I guess it comes back to you know, if you're a developer, you know. Um, you wouldn't want to flood the market and see prices, you know, go down. I mean, I know that sounds incredibly simplistic, um, but, you know, I guess, you know, from a development point of view, I mean, you have development stages too for issues around cash flow, so I guess there's that sort of component. But, um, but you know, I think it it's one of those tensions. Um, I don't have a solution for it, but it is one of those tensions where you've got, you know, the residential development sector saying we've got issues with council approvals and local government get out of the way, supply and infrastructure charges. And then, you know, we don't have the completions. Um, and, you know, and is that a factor of, well, they're waiting for the market to be, you know, the right time to do stuff to maximise. So it is, it's one of these inherent tensions about having the private sector, you know, be the primary deliverer of housing in Australia, you know, and I think the only way we can really kind of overcome that is, um, you know, so much more government delivered social and affordable housing, um, you know, so delivered at such, you know, at, at scale. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I mean, gosh, it, I just remember in two thousand and seven, you know, hearing the same stuff from the development industry. You know, it's red tape, it's infrastructure charges, it's council delays and, and zoning are just, you know, we're we're in this constant broken record in the, the in the housing space. Um that 15 years later, you know, it's still the same stuff. 
So I guess, yeah, we we just, again, I think uh, without answering the question that I put to you before, I think that's part of it. Obviously, what we, we need to really do this as a team, don't we? We need to get the people right around the table talking yeah. about how we're going to meet this aspirational goal. I mean, it's great that we've got that set set by the, the at National Council, um, but really it's going to be the state and territory governments to make it happen, isn't it? It, it is, and and I think it's too about what's like what's um aspirational, and then how do we follow that up with, um you know so the government's put the three billion dollars on the table as incentives for the sort of completions, you know, so the delivery component, but um you know I guess it, it's that about how we operate in Australia between the feds and the states and, you know, and you want collegiality. And so we've got this 1.2 million homes as a aspiration, but um, I don't know, like, do, are we, are we going to have to get to the point where there's much stronger kind of, um, I don't know, uh, where, where there's, I don't know, funding withheld from states when things, you know, when when they don't bring certain things to the party in relation to housing supply or or rental reform, you know, like what is it that the feds could do um, to make sure that action happens um, rather than relying always on aspiration? Yeah, aspiration's one thing, but it's got to, you've got to have the belief and then you've got to have the commitment haven't we mm. got to have that urgency to make it happen? And my one last question, we, we will have to wrap up. Yeah. Um, look, you're, um, you've been at National Shelter now for about 15, 16 months, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, you know, it's uh, it's very exciting to see a woman leading uh, and influencing the conversations at national level on housing and homelessness side by side, other other very strong, uh, powerful advocates as well, like Wendy and, and Cassandra and Kate and, and others. Um, have you got any messages you'd like to put out there in terms of um, your leadership journey and uh, what it means now to be, I guess, leading these conversations in the national media and and what and how you feel about that where you are today and and I guess what you'd like your legacy from here to be. Um, well, I think I think in terms of leadership, like you've got to find your style of leadership. Do you know that not. There's no one way to be a leader. There's no one way to lead conversations, um, you know, and you, you've got to find the style that you feel comfortable with, but that's also, you know, effective. Um, I think the other thing is, is, you know, there will be times of discomfort um, because you might have to do things that you're not naturally inclined to do. Um, but, but that's also good because, you know, we all we all have to sort of lean into that that discomfort. So, um, you know, I'm highly introverted. So going into meetings and doing stuff is like you kind of put your face on and like put your armour on and you get yourself ready. And some of it could be like really um, like it's not a natural style sometimes, but then, you know, you have that and the armor, you do that and then the armour comes off and you go back. So I think... You've got to work in a way that is, um, you know, that is um, true to to the who you are, um, and not be something that you're not, because I think that can become really quite self evident. Hmm. So I'm assuming we won't be hearing you singing at a national housing conference in October, like your predecessor might have. No, that's <laughs> uh, there'll be no singing and there'll be no interpretive dance. <laughs> Emma Greenhouse, it's been a pleasure having you on sharing the couch thank you uh, all the best for your work um, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in the housing and homes the space and you're right in the in the middle of it and we're all uh, going to come along the ride and support you so all the best with that journey thanks so much Peter and thanks to um, NT Shelter for, for for doing sharing the couch as well Thank you, Emma. And uh, you've been uh, watching or listening to Emma Greenhouse, the Chief Executive Officer of National Shelter. If you've enjoyed this uh, podcast, then please like it, share it, subscribe, uh, do all those things that help it get out to more people so more people can hear the conversations we're having around our housing system. And, and for me personally, you learn a lot today from, from the whole urban design planning and uh, build environment area. It was very, very interesting. So thanks once again to Emma. 
And thank you for listening or watching on. And until next time, bye for now.